minutes for allowing me to preach. Uh, it is nerve-wracking, especially when you're put on the spot to uh, preach right away. Um, but um, my dad always taught me to be ready uh, in an instant, to be ready in season and out of season. Um, so take your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. Real quick, um, a little about myself. I'm 23 years old, and I am at Maranatha Baptist University uh, studying uh, Christian ministry. And um, God's led my heart in the area of ministry with kids, uh, whoever it may be. Um, and so right now I'm taking a semester off to uh, pay for school. And I plan on going back this fall. Uh, the first time preaching away from home, I would say, was uh, November 2015. Uh, pastor had asked, he always had a preacher voice come and preach for him. And this was in hot Florida, in Ocala, Ocala Florida. It was about 100 degrees, and um, they had a tent meeting, and the pastor said, how about we have one of your preacher boys come out and preach? And so the president of the college said, well, I think Nathan will be ready to do that. So, of course, he let me know two days ahead of time, which I think that's what normally pastors do, is let them not know really short notice. So anyways, I uh, got there, and he said, well, there's not going to be a lot of people here, but um, give the word, and... Uh, so I got up there, and sure enough, there was about 300 people there. So, uh, so that was very nerve-wracking. So anyways, uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to look at verses 30 through 39. And um, when you get there, say amen, just so I know that you have it. And I'm not uh, reading, and you're not there. So verse 30, it says, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he prepared the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the members of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice in the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass as at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy, name, at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this night, Lord. I pray that you'll be with me right now. Give me the words to say, Lord, that I say it in the way that you see fit. I pray that it will speak to not only my heart, Lord, but... I pray that it will speak to these that are listening, Lord, and those that are listening live stream as well. Pray that you're blessed tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we see in this passage of Scripture, you probably know this story very well. Elijah was in competition with 480 prophets of Baal and of Jezebel. And, of course, he had defeated them, had done, done this, um, this uh, tradition that was supposed to be done. And it came time when the offering was supposed to be offered that the Lord, the fire of God, came down and consumed that burnt sacrifice. Of course, the people fell on their faces and said, the Lord is God. But can you imagine being there that day, seeing this? If you can just picture in your mind, uh, first off, four barrels of water on a burnt offering, no fire is going to consume that. I mean, it's soaked, it's wet. Um, if you pour water onto a fire, what usually happens? The fire goes out. Um, there's no way in the world, I mean, you could, scientists probably say, there's no way in the world that this fire could just come down and consume the whole altar. And then, not only that, but 
Elijah had the victory with these prophets, but not only that, God gave him the strength to destroy all these prophets, single-handedly. And this was a spiritual high for Elijah. He felt he had won a major battle, which he did. But then we read down, look down at chapter 19, verse 1. And we'll read that. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, talking about Elijah, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. So we see this big victory. We see Elijah just experience God's hand, and then all of a sudden we read down in chapter 19, and this prophet, amazing prophet, is discouraged. He is defeated. And so the title of the message today is From the Top of the Mount Victory, to the valley of defeat. How do we get out of the valley of defeat? You know, how many times in our Christian life do we hit a spiritual high? We're on top of the world. We're on top of that mountain. It feels like no one can get in our way. And then one thing happens. It doesn't have to be big. It can be a very small little thing. And we quickly become defeated. We start to slowly turn backwards. Look at verse 4 again. It says, But he himself himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said it is enough now O lord take away my life for i am no better than my father's this act of defeat is what puts so many christians on their back in the face of disaster so you may wonder how does a christian turn a victory into defeat well, number one, if you're taking notes, they forget the promises of God's work. Right. Elijah had just had this amazing victory. He was sitting somewhere where he wasn't supposed to be. He was first out of the way he was supposed to be. He forgot that God still had a work for him to do. Verse 3 speaks on, look at verse 3. It says, and when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. So he didn't take take his servant with him. He left his servant there and decides to go by himself to this wilderness. How many times do we fall in trouble by ourselves? That's right. Come on. We we have a brother beside us, we have a sister beside us, we have friends that care about us, that love the Lord, that are strengthening us. But when we get discouraged and we get defeated, we immediately say, All right, I'm not gonna call. I'm not going to text. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to go somewhere by myself. You know what? Satan sees that and he's like, yeah. this, is, this is high time. Now it's time. I can hit him easily now. And we forget God's promises. And you know what? How many times do we forget, oh wait, God protected me before. If God can protect me before, he can do it again. Amen. So number one, they forget the promises of God's word. Number two, we focus on ourselves. Elijah set himself in a place all alone. And when alone, there's more temptation. There are things that get in our way. And instead, we focus on that temptation or we focus on that thing that may be important instead of on Jesus Christ. We need to look to Jesus in every situation in our life. I think a lot of times we don't. We, I know for a fact, I mean, we can all be honest. If be honest, you can raise your hands. How many of you have ever been tempted? All of our hands go up. If you didn't raise your hand, then you're lying to yourself. But honestly, we have been tempted. And how many times do we give into that temptation? Don't raise your hand, but think about it. How many times do we give in because we are like, well, there's nothing for you else to do. You know what? I'm, I'm basically chopped liver, as some people say. You know? But we tend to take our focus off of Jesus Christ. 
what does it say? I think it's in Ephesians where it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So if we're looking at the circumstance instead of looking to Jesus, we're never going to win. So number one, they forget the promises of God. Number two, they focus on themselves. Number three, we start doubting God. Yep. Remember when Sarah doubted? Yeah. When the angel of the Lord came to Abraham and said, your wife's going to have a baby, and she started laughing. Mm -hmm. She said, there's no way in the world. I'm old. I'm decrepit. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I can't do anything. How in the world am I going to have a baby at this age? And even, I'm pretty sure even Abraham thought, this, is, this angel is crazy. But you know what? God makes a way out of no way. Come on, man. There are people, many people in the Bible that doubted God. We can be that same way. There are so many times we doubt God when it comes to finances. Finances get tough. We find our escape to go to the lottery and try to do that because we think it might work. How about falling out of, falling out of church because we start doubting God? You know, life seems like it's going nowhere. Um, I... I even use myself, I mean, coming back from school, taking a semester off, I honestly thought, okay, there's no way in the world. Nobody's hiring at this time. I mean, it's school time. People are going back to school. They already have the people they need. And you know what? When I was looking for a job, my parents told me, don't get a job where you're going to have to work Sundays, you're going to have to work Wednesdays, because as soon as you do that, we'll take you out of church. It may pay more. I mean, I had two job offers that were going to pay me a, a good, substantial amount of money, but they wanted me to work Sundays. And I said, absolutely not. You know what? I waited and waited and waited. Got a call from the first job, and they said, we'll give you two, two jobs in the same place for two different paychecks. I was like, this is unheard of. They said, we want you to work for us. We saw, we've talked to your boss before. You're a great worker. And you don't have to work Sundays, you don't have to work Wednesdays. I said, all right, well, there you go. God provides. But if I doubted God and said, you know what, money's not coming in, I'm a poor college student, I'm not making anything, I should just go ahead and work. My spiritual life would be a, sh a mess. I would be out of church, I would slowly fall away from God, and sure enough, I would be backslidden and distracted and defeated. So number one, they forget the promises of God. They focus on themselves. <laughs> number two, they, number three, they start doubting God. And then number four, they allow the little things to distract them. Yeah. There are so many types of things that can cause defeat. And when we get so distracted by other things in our life, it could be simple, simple little things. You know what? Do you notice that I keep saying the little things, because it's not the big things that get us, it's the little things in life that cause us to fall on our back, to fall out of church, to fall out of God's word. I don't know how many times myself I've fallen into that. I, I think we can all say we've fallen into this. We must turn to God in these types of situations. Do you see that Elijah, did he turn to God during this time? No, he turned to himself. God had to show him a miracle. God, you, if you read the rest of the chapter, I'm not going to read it tonight due to time. But if you read down, God fed him. And then the angel of God touched him again and said, what are you doing here? Like, why are you even here? You're supposed to be going to work. And what are you doing? You're sitting here moping, whining because Jezebel is going to kill you. Who was bigger than Jezebel? God was. God just allowed Elijah to defeat all these prophets single-handedly. And he was scared of a woman that was probably sitting in her throne room not going to do anything. She was going to send somebody to kill him. She wasn't going to do it herself. She was a coward. So was Ahab. And you know what? Elijah was so discouraged that he decided to go away. God had to speak to him in a still small voice to get his attention. You know what? In these passages of scripture that we look at, this helps us understand the importance of overcoming defeat and getting victory back in our life. So many Christians don't have victory because they're so distracted by, well, I, I'm not doing this, or they got the job offer before me, or 
whatever it may be, or she didn't smile at me, or he didn't smile at me, and they get so discouraged over the little things and get distracted That's right. and become defeated. So how do we get, we talked about the things that cause us to get into the valley of defeat, but really I want to talk about how do we get out of the valley of defeat. If you're taking notes, number one, we need to rely on God. Turn to Psalms 37. Probably know this, this passage very well. Psalms 37 and verse 3. It says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Number 5, verse 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him shall bring it to pass. Amen. That verse has gotten me through a lot of tough times when I was away from home dealing with other things. There are so many times we forget God knows everything. God knows everything. He can take care of us. We must rely on him. I was thinking about when I got the news, because um, it was all over the news about Kobe Bryant dying. And you know what? He probably was just doing his own normal thing that he does every day probably wasn't thinking about Sunday, going to church. He probably was just doing his normal routine. God knew that was going to happen. Everybody's like, this is devastating. How could God allow this to happen? You know what? God knows everything. Amen. God, God knew that he would get into that helicopter and take off and crash. God knew that. God knows every situation. So why can't we rely on him when we're in trouble? Number two, we must go to God with our problems. Oh. Proverbs 3. You know that scripture as well. These are simple scriptures, but they are very, very important. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. You know this verse by heart. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. We all know this verse very well, but think about the words. Lean not unto thine own understanding. We go to other people. We go to, to our counselors. We go to our pastors, which is good. But we must, number one, go to God. Amen. He is the one who knows our problems. And isn't it great to know that God knows exactly. When you come to God and you're like, God, I am having a horrible day. God's saying, yep, I know. God knows. And I feel like we as Christians, we think God is just totally not paying attention to our lives. Oh, well, he's focused in China right now, or he's focused somewhere else. He's not focused on me. No, God is focused on you. He cares about you. To know that we have a God who will take care of us in the time of need. Number three. So number one, we need to rely on God. Number two, we must go to God with our problems. Number three. We must let God take care of the situation. Second Kings chapter six. Second Kings chapter six, and you get there. Say Amen. Verse fifteen. We you know this story. The uh, Assyrians were coming to fight against the Israelites, and Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha, and his servant were sitting on a. Uh, it was a rooftop, is what I, I was reading it, on a rooftop. And it says in verse 15, And when the servant of the man of God, talking about Elisha, had risen early and gone forth, behold, and host come past the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open, thy, open his eyes, that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was filled of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Can you imagine being that young man? He, his eyes are blinded right now, and he's thinking, Vic, we're going to die. We are going to die. There are so many horses and chariots right now, Elisha, and I don't know what to do. What are we going to do? Elisha, I'm pretty sure Elisha probably shook his head and said, this, this young man, 
said, Lord, open his eyes. And to see that young servant see the power of God. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open the eyes of this young man. This is so amazing, and this story is so powerful. God, again, shows himself real when he took care of the problem. If you read on in this passage, you see God took care of the situation. Uh, Elisha prayed again to God and said, smite this people, I pray that you would blindness. And you know what? They ended up eating in, in Israel and eating and went back home like nothing had happened. But you know what? Can you imagine if, a, if that young man said, you know what? We need to go out there and fight him. Let's go. And just took off. He probably would have been dead. They probably wouldn't have been recording it in this scripture. But how many times can you say you have seen God work in your life? Um, just like I talked about the job. There's probably tons of examples that I could give and tons of examples you could give how God took care of you in the time you need. God is so good takes care of us even when we don't go to him right away with our problems. And then lastly tonight, we must not let circumstances predict our future walk for God. 2 Samuel 11, you go there. You guys, I'm pretty sure you know this story. David's great sin with Bathsheba. David was on a spiritual high. If you read the chapter before chapter 11, you see, he just defeated an army, and he was somewhere where he wasn't supposed to be. Verse 25 through 27, it says, Then David said unto the messenger, Thus saith, thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bared him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And if you read on, you see how Nathan came to David and told him a story of a, a man with a, with a sheep. And David got very, very angry. And Nathan said, you're the man. Yeah. Can you imagine, I, I heard a pastor say, David fell back on his throne as though he was shot in, into the chest. It, it was like a dagger going into his heart to realize that he had messed up. You know what? We know the story. How David's sin didn't just affect him, it affected his whole family. What does it say? The sword never left David's home after that situation. But God still used him in a mighty way. Jesus Christ was in his royal lineage. This is a beautiful picture of God still using those that have sinned against him. You know what? God can still use you. You may be defeated. You may be down on your back. You may think that there's no way you're going to get out of this. But you know what? God can still use you. You must go to him and ask for forgiveness and say, God, I want to serve you. Come on. Second example, Luke 22. Luke chapter 22, and verse 54. This is Peter's denial of Christ. Verse 54, it says, Then they took, then took they him, and led him, and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, and were sat down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, and he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. Of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another confidingly affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crowed. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said unto him, Before the cock crowed, Thou shalt deny me Christ. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. 
Can you imagine that night? Everybody had forsaken Jesus. Jesus was all by himself in that, in that courtroom. And Peter had followed afar off. But Peter, when he was, he was confronted, denied Christ three times. And as Jesus walked out, can you just imagine the picture with me? As Jesus walked out and looked into Peter's face. Could you imagine seeing the hurt on Jesus' face? Because Jesus knew Peter would deny him. Peter was a man known to stick his foot in his mouth. And he was very outgoing and he was good at it. But this time his mouth got the best of him. Jesus had told him exactly what would happen. And he said, no, Lord, I would never do that. Lord, I'll be with you till death. But you know what? He quickly changed when he was confronted. But even when he did this, still later, he became the head man of the Church of Acts. God still used him. Amen. People say, well, he made a big mistake. And you have it. We all have. We've all made a big mistake. We've, we've put ourselves in situations where we look absolutely stupid, foolish. But God still uses us. God used him even in his defeat and failure. And then lastly, Genesis 16. Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 through 3. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing, I pray thee, go in unto thy unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram, that's where he messed up. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. This is not, this wasn't unheard of back then. But for Abraham, it was. Abraham was a man of God. He was, he, was, he was living right until he stepped in front of God's plan for him and Sarah. God still blessed them with a son. And, and na his name was Isaac. And he was known as a friend of God. Could you be known as a friend of God today? And a father of many nations. But Abraham had messed up several times. Remember when he went to Egypt, he lied and said his wife was his sister. Yep. And then he, he had intercourse with, with his, his own handmaid. And you know what? God still blessed Abraham. But you know what? Can you imagine if Abraham didn't turn to God? If he had just said, you know what? I give up. I messed up. I'm not going to go back to God. Do you think he would have been made, known as a friend of God? Absolutely not. So think about it tonight as we close. What do you do with your defeat? Do you turn to yourself? Or do you turn to God? God cares and wants you to come to Him and give your problems to Him and be back on that mountaintop instead of in the valley. Think about that tonight.